Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Hashtag Clocked In with me, your host, Jordan Edwards. I'm thrilled to have you tune in as we dive into the dynamic world of productivity, success, and stories of incredible individuals who've mastered the art of getting things done. Whether you're commuting, hitting the gym, or just relaxing at home, this podcast is the go-to source for inspiration and actionable tips to level up your productivity game. I'm on a mission to unravel the secrets of those who seem to effortlessly manage their time and achieve their goals. So if you're ready to clock in and unlock your full potential, you're in the right place. We've got a lineup of amazing guests, industry experts, and thought leaders who will share their insights and strategies to help us crush your to-do list and make the most out of every moment. Get ready to get inspired, motivated, and equipped with the tools you need to supercharge your productivity. This is Hashtag Clocked In with Jordan Edwards. Let's dive in. Hey, what's going on, guys? We've got a special guest today. We have Aaron Bakken. He's been an entrepreneur for 22 years, both owning three franchise systems and five businesses of his own. He's been the VP of a franchise development of an international franchise group. Welcome, Aaron. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Yeah, we're excited to have you on the Clocked In podcast. Aaron, where does your journey begin? So my entrepreneurial journey begins in San Francisco in 2001. I had been working in the world of dot-com 1.0. And in 2001, I think it's about 95% of the investment world began to realize that none of these businesses are ever going to amount to anything and I uh, lost my job. And since I was in sales in that realm, it was very difficult to find a new position. And my wife at the time had a pretty successful small freelance design, uh, advertising and art direction business. And so I started helping her. And before I knew it, we had uh, we were working seven days a week. We had a bunch of new clients and needed to create some balance in our life. So we leased an office, hired a bunch of employees, and we ended up um, for three years on the fastest growing companies list, the top 50 in the San Francisco Bay Area with this agency. It was, it was awesome. It was particularly awesome because you're, you're talking about Silicon Valley and, and the Bay Area. We were the smallest company by far on that list. So it was pretty cool to be rubbing elbows with some um, awesome entrepreneurs. And then we had Whoa. a client that was a franchise. And so we ended up getting involved yeah. in that franchise piece. But yeah, that's how I became an, an entrepreneur. That was very accidentally. <laughs> First of all, I think that's absolutely incredible how you were able to turn something as bad as losing your job. And uh, I mean, maybe there's people who are losing their job right now who lost their job and looked around and figured out the assets that you had in that moment. Because would you have ever considered working with your wife at that that time? No. (laughs) I mean, literally... It started because I asked her, when was the last time you invoiced a client? Because I was looking at, we had just purchased a house. We'd overpaid by about 30% of the asking price. That was the early days of the overbidding on homes in the Bay Area. And she said, I I don't know, maybe three months ago. So that was the first thing I did. I started writing invoices to her clients. And, um, you know, since I've always been a salesperson, I started putting my sales hat on and started reaching out to some of the companies that I knew and was doing cold calling. And and that's kind of how it happened. I just... I, I would say fear more than anything else drove me to help uh, grow our business. Absolutely. I mean, because some people don't realize it, that there's a lot of value in what they already have. And you just have to figure out where all the pieces fit, which is Correct. very intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was a wild ride. Um, it was definitely not, it, it, tr- again, truly, it was an accidental thing. I mean, I, I had, um, ironically, I've been part of an entrepreneurship group in the future business leaders of america organization in high school but i honestly joined it because a couple of my friends were in it and it sounded like a fun way to waste some time and um you know little did i know that 12 years later i would be an entrepreneur and i would really never look back yeah and what was that change like for you because obviously you were going up the corporate ladder like going in that direction what was that transition like for you Yeah, I I really was. I mean, in my 20s, I moved every two years. I moved from um, Wisconsin to London, uh, England, and then back to the United States and then to Seattle, Silicon Valley, uh, East Bay in San Francisco, Chicago, and back. And yeah, I was climbing the corporate ladder. That's how I kept moving. I kept getting promoted. And it was scary, honestly. I I didn't really know what to do. Uh, You know, when you've been in a sales type of role, you learn to be a bit of a chameleon in the sense that, you know, as long as you can wrap your head around 
the subject matter of what you're selling, you can go sell almost anything. But when nobody wants to hire you, it, it was a very strange experience. And so I, I think that the, the best part about it and the part that kind of started to alleviate that fear is when you close a couple of new clients and you begin to realize, oh, I, I'm actually not completely full of crap. I actually know what I'm talking about. I've been able to convince people to sign up with us. And then you begin to see the results. And if your mind and your heart is in the right place in business, I find that you really can begin to grow something. I mean, granted, there are plenty of people out there, plenty of examples of people that are savvy business people, but they're also ruthless and don't really have much of a heart. And that's kind of a recurring theme for me is that if you're going to be in business, particularly if you're going to want my help, you have to be in it to win it, not just for yourself. It has to be something that it's about your employees. It's about the customers you're working with or your clients, whatever you want to call them. And that you need to always have in mind this idea of, of the collective whole. And um, I didn't know a whole lot about that back then, but we were lucky that we had a number of really cool, interesting clients. At the time, our focus was on luxury goods, products, real estate, and destinations. So think of wineries and high-end condominium uh, developments, uh, clothing and um, day spas or, or uh, destination spas. It was a very cool client base. And so it ended up being a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, you know. I will tell all of my clients that you are probably going to be the worst boss you've ever worked for because as self-employed people, <laughs> ultimately, um, I have found that you'll expect more of yourself than you would ever expect of an employee. And, you know, I actually was just having lunch with someone today and he said, yeah, the funny thing about entrepreneurs is that they trade in that 40 to 45 hour a week job for a 60 to 80 hour a week job working for themselves. And, you know, and that's, Again, that's kind of a funny way to look at it. And that can sometimes be true, but it's also part of the beauty of self-employment is that you have this baby and you're, and you're raising it and you're growing it. And it doesn't feel like work if it's the right thing. And if you're doing the right things with your business. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's funny because a lot of people say that where it's you're working the 40 hours, but then you have 80 hours if you're on your own. And I think it comes down to that that fear element of I got to make this happen. I got to create this. This has to come to life because throughout the all the episodes I've had, it always comes down to people being like, it was this and there was no other option. Like I was going in on this and this is what was happening. So how was that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean, that was certainly true. Um of that first business and uh, the, some of the subsequent ones that I've created where they ended up being born out of necessity. Um, either something I had started hadn't worked the way I had hoped. And so a new opportunity came along. So I sidelined that other, that, that business and started something new. Um, the biggest thing that I've learned in this 22 year trajectory of owning both franchises and, and my own businesses when you're doing something on your own, you're like, you're on an island. You, you honestly, unless you've found a way to cultivate people who are doing something similar to you in your general network, but they're, they're non-competitive or they're so far away from you geographically that they're willing to share their best practices. But that's, I mean, the majority of entrepreneurs don't have that. Maybe they have a coach, but that coach may not even have subject matter expertise in the world of business that they're in. And so all the mistakes that I have made in my own businesses were almost always the result of not having a broader perspective or a broader group of people to pull um, ideas from or to stop me from jumping off that cliff or to stop me from hiring the wrong vendor or investing in the wrong piece of real estate or whatever. And what I've learned from my, that journey is that franchising mitigates the majority of those issues. You're basically buying into a system that's proven or at least pretty well proven, but you also are going to be one of many, many people running the same business just in a different geographic area. And I find that actually that cohort of people that you're that are running that business like you elsewhere is actually more valuable over time than the franchise system itself. It's this, it's this whole thing of, you know, if something is rolled out as a promotion and you you find it's not working in your office or your location or for your business, you can pick up the phone and call one of your fellow franchisees and say, hey, this isn't working for me. I heard that it's really working great for you. What are you doing? You know, and within a, within a matter of a 20 minute conversation, you can suddenly have totally have changed your perspective on how that can work. And, um, you know, th things really change. And so you know, franchising isn't always the option 
and, and the answer for everything. But I think the biggest thing is that if you ever decide to get into business, the hard way of what, what I've learned is that find help, get a mentor, get a coach, or be part of a system where there's that built-in support so you're not on an island. Because, man, it is a lonely place, especially when things are not going the way you planned on. Or the bank is calling up and saying, uh, hey, are you going to pay your debt this month? <laughs> So anyway, I, not that I've ever been there. I've, I'm just saying. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that's honestly one of the reasons I started uh, Edwards Consulting, which is a it's a group where you meet and everyone is from a different industry and they get different perspectives. So I completely agree with what you're saying. Where if you have other viewpoints, there's such an advantage to that. So yeah. who were some of the viewpoints, uh, some of the perspectives that helped you in your career? Well, I'll be honest. My my dad has been a huge uh, influence, and he has he doesn't have any kind of entrepreneurial experience. He's he was a banker, but he is someone who has always been my champion. Uh, He has oftentimes been my financier, my my seed capital financier for a number of the things that I have invested in. Um, I've always paid him back, even when the business wasn't successful. I'm a firm believer that uh, you know you shouldn't leave the people that have helped you get into your, your endeavor um, out cold if the business doesn't go well. In fact, the, the deals I've always had with my investors is, look, if, even if the business fails, and even if it takes me 20 years, I will make sure that you at least get your money back, even if it means I don't. That Some people would say that that's crazy. That's part of the risk you take with investing in somebody. But I don't know. I just I, I work a little bit differently, think a little bit differently. Thankfully, I haven't ever been in a position where I've had to really make good on that promise. And I, I just exited out of my franchise business last week down to trampoline park. And while it was a long road and my investors didn't get the money they were planning on during the journey, they definitely have at the, at the exit. And so, you know, it's just, it's not always a pretty road to get to that place, but um, you know, with the right guidance and, and the right help, you'll get there. So my, my dad was one, but two, you know, I have used coaches over the years, uh, not consistently, I've used them mostly when I felt like I really needed more outside guidance and help, or I felt like maybe I was stuck. And, um, you know, getting back to the, when I've been involved in a franchise, it's reaching out to my fellow franchisees and and asking that question of what am I missing? Why is this not working for me? How is, how is it working for you? So, um, you know, I find that, Every person is going to be a little bit different. Some people are going to want one-on-one coaching and want that level of accountability. Some people would rather have like a group coaching environment or maybe even just a group of people that they know professionally that may be in different businesses, but they can sit together as a mastermind group and hold each other accountable. Whatever it is, however you get there, you need to do it. You need to definitely realize that you don't have a monopoly on good ideas as much as you might think you do. And outside perspectives are always going to keep you both humble, grounded, but also, I think, you know, and importantly, second guess some of the bigger decisions you're about to make. Because, man, you know, if you decide to plunk down 50 grand or 100 grand on new equipment or in a major marketing campaign for your business, and if it isn't well thought out or if it isn't the strategic direction your business should be going in, it can be a disaster. And so oh. having people there to, to help you second guess and or at least bounce the ideas off of to me has been an effective and essential part of my success. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And I appreciate you sharing that just because there's so many times when we think, Oh, we did it on our own. That's never true. We always did it with other people. And the cool thing that you're bringing up right now, Aaron, is that you're utilizing your model with the franchise is the same idea when people are working in the same company, it's the same idea when people make friendships, they use them as a resource. And I view correct. What I viewed most of the time is that we don't utilize our resources unless we want something from them, unless we need something from them. And if you could use it in a very collaborative way of like saying, Hey man, like, what do you think of this perspective? Not like I'm trying to do any deals or anything, just like, what do you think of this? Like, is this a good idea or a bad idea? If you have them incentivized in the proper direction, it's even better help because then they really want to help you. Um, so, yeah, one yeah. of the things, if I may, just on that line of thinking, it's really easy as an entrepreneur to be very self focused. You know, you're busting your ass to try and make your business work. And so when you go out there and you network or you're looking for guidance, 
it's really easy to be very kind of focused on your needs and not thinking about why am I, why are the people from outside of my organization? International is a networking organization. They have this idea of givers gain, I think it is. I may be crediting it to the wrong organization. And what I've, what I've learned is that when you're out there doing these types of things, yes, it's okay to ask for help. Yes, it's okay to ask for a referral. But at the same point in time, the best way to navigate that whole world is to sell through people, not to them, and to recognize that sometimes giving to people the things you can learn by helping someone solve their problem suddenly create aha moments for yourself. I, it's been weird sometimes how I've gone into a meeting thinking, I, I really need to meet a particular person or a particular type of client. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. And you end up in some side conversation with someone's explaining a problem they're having in their business. And I'm like, oh, I've been through that. And this is what I did. And all of a sudden it reminded me of, well, that's actually the same solution to the problem I'm experiencing in my business. How the hell didn't I think of that sooner kind of thing? So being more open-minded and being more prepared to share. Um, you can even you know, use that principle of pay it forward kind of idea that maybe you're helping that individual. They may not be able to help you directly, but by you helping them, they're going to try and help somebody. And you, you're just creating a better ecosystem of mutual support. I, I just, to me, philosophically speaking, I think it's an important thing to remember if you're going to go into business for yourself, because it's really easy as an entrepreneur to be very self-focused because you're freaked and you want to make sure your business is going to work. And most of the conversations you want to have are about making it work versus thinking more broadly. Just again, because I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, and I I think that's a very good point because also when you give, like when you're providing value to other people, that builds good good rapport with them. So when you do come up and you go, hey, man, I'm starting this business or I'm doing this business or I'm doing this, this is something you might be interested in they're much more open to that conversation because it's not like, hey, everything with Aaron's a transaction. It, it's it's a very different feeling. It, it's more like, hey, we're on this path together. Aaron can help me. Jordan can help me. Whatever it is might work. So yeah. Aaron, for you, what was, you, you mentioned how the freelancing business was taking off and then one of your clients was a franchisee. Yeah. How, how did that work? Yeah. So we were at a, a a photo shoot, they had, we had redesigned all the packaging for their, their product labels. It was an all natural bath and body products retail franchise. It was very new as a franchise. Um, wonderful product line. This is back when the idea of all natural bath and body products and facial products was still kind of a new thing. And the, the ladies in the, that owned the business were wonderfully creative. Um, they were frankly awful franchisee, franchisors in terms of how they approach the business and this idea that, hey, we're paying you a royalty to actually get support. Um, back then was kind of the beginning of e-commerce and almost all the money we spent felt like went into feeding their e-commerce business, which benefited them. But it, regardless, it was a wonderful learning experience. It was an awesome business. And we got into it because during that photo shoot, we said to them, why don't you have a day spa incorporated into your bath and body products and spa products retail business? And at the end of the weekend, yeah. they said to us, you know, it's a great idea. Why don't you guys do it? And so they gave us a, you know, made it very fiscally advantageous for us to start the business up. And um, we had no idea really what we were doing aside from just having ideas. And with some of their initial support and help, we ended up creating what ended up being their highest volume business in their small little franchise group. And the best thing I learned from that experience, aside from your franchise or that you're working with, if you get into franchising, has to be in it to win it with you, not through you or from you. It needs to be a mutually you know, beneficial relationship. But was getting involved in something that makes you feel good about it yourself, makes you feel good about why you're in business in the first place. You know, if 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 for someone you've you've always wanted to do something that benefits kids and and because maybe you had a tough childhood or you didn't have a lot of money growing up or uh, whatever your situation may be. If, if getting into a business that can help people that are in circumstances like you is really going to feed your heart and your soul, then you should listen to that. You should do that. For me, it was just literally seeing the look of relaxation on the face of that person that came in stressed out, middle of the day, this is their lunch hour, they have an hour to get a massage, and they come out a completely different person. It was really an awesome thing, and it made me realize that being in business doesn't have to just be about making money. 
you can actually pair this idea of feeling like you're making a difference. And again, that, that could be as simple as helping somebody fix their plumbing problem if you're into plumbing. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, medium. it's just, I find that you're going to be far more committed and far more excited to show up in your business day in and day out if it at least is somehow paired with some sense of passion or benefit or or whatever that feeds you in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very important to find that purpose, whatever that may be. Um, sometimes it's for some of the people doing e-commerce, it's the brand when the brand, when they sell a lot of items, the brand's super happy and that that's a cool moment. Or maybe it's um, you get on a podcast and people are excited there. It can be anything. And like the whole thing is that if you view your business through that lens of, who am I helping? How am I helping them? You're going to be a lot more comfortable and happy with the experience that you provide. And you're going to want more people to come in. <laughs> well, that too. And I think it's it's one of the foundational principles of how you create good culture in a business. Um, you know, I've heard for three decades now in my professional career, people talk about culture, culture, culture. And very few companies I find successfully create it. They talk about it but it's not well mirrored by the management people responsible for overseeing the teams that are in there in the trenches getting things done. And that becomes more and more complicated the bigger a company gets. But there, it, it is absolutely possible. I've seen them. We've got a number of franchises in my brokerage uh, portfolio that are in business systems that you would think would be so damn boring. How could there possibly be culture there? But one of the best culture franchises in our, in our brokerage group is a business called The Brothers That Just Do Gutters. They, they do gutters, basically. But they have sold a ton in the last year, year and a half since their launch. I mean, they have an amazing sales organization that's helping them. But what I hear all over and over again is how all the franchisees love that the culture at the corporate office and the culture that's permeating through down to them has made it easy for them to then recreate that culture in their own business. Um, that, to me, is is really the the secret sauce in any kind of a business is that if you can get your employees that are working for you to show up day in and day out and feel like they're making a difference. Even like I said, even if it's putting on gutters or cleaning somebody's house, it's so critical to one's success. And more importantly, it should help you sleep at night. Um, aside from just looking at the balance in your bank account. I, I just feel like that's such a critical piece. Right. And so, um, you know, again, assuming somebody has a moral compass, which not every piece, not every person in business does, but, um, it's just a, it's a recurring theme for me with all the people that I help. It's look, if you could be very successful with these three franchise territories that you purchased, I want you to remember that you're not going to get there alone. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the people you're going to hire to help you get stuff done. If you get to a point that someone wants to buy your your franchise business, take care of your people, too. You didn't do you didn't do it alone. I mean, I, I just went through this. I, I think I mentioned earlier, I sold my trampoline mm -hmm. park franchise last week. And I lived four hours away from that business for the last almost seven years. And I went through a, a couple of different, three different managers in the beginning of my first year. It was painful because I was up there all the time and I had young kids. And I finally found a woman who we were very like-minded and um, I gave her the space to make the right decisions. I had to, I was just so fatigued with the travel back and forth and fretting all the time. And she ran with it. And I, I provided her with guidance, but I gave her the space to really treat the business like her own. And she built a team that when we closed in the transaction, everybody was crying. We were so like sad. We were going to miss everybody, but at the same point in time, really happy. And I paid them all. They all got, they got money from me that was above and beyond what their salaries had been for helping me get to this point. And I'm not saying that because I deserve some sort of award. I'm just saying... You need to keep that perspective in mind. I mean, my mid-level management team had no expectation, and they were, frankly, according to my now former general manager of the business, flabbergasted that I even given them anything. I guess it's just it's culturally in this country, it seems we've gotten really greedy, and particularly the people at the top. And I, I really encourage my clients to remember you're not getting there by yourself. Take care of your people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually got kind of chills when you were telling that story. Um, so I applaud you. And I think that's an awesome headspace and perspective to have. So let's simplify it. What, what's a franchise if someone has no idea? Like, 
what's the difference between a franchise and then someone who's starting a business? I know you've kind of vaguely explained it, but like, what is it definitively? So franchise is effectively a business system in a box. You've got someone or some people that have created a business. They've made it successful. They're making money. They've got strong marketing and branding. They've got an operational system. They probably have a strong technology system in place to manage all the data that's flowing through their business. And they've recognized, okay, I've got two different avenues I could I could follow to try and grow my business. I could continue to open up more offices or more locations or more retail stores or put more vans in the street and hire managers that I hope show up day in and day out to run those remote offices and put my name against those leases as a personal guarantee and get more loans or whatever. Or I could, if, if my business makes sense as a franchise, I could turn it into a franchise opportunity. And that is in this idea that You've got it all figured out and you someone comes in and says, I want to pay you to basically cut to the chase. I want to start a business like yours and I want you to help me get there. So it's 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 the entrepreneurial thing. I, I want to own a business, but it's realizing I don't maybe have a strong idea. Or maybe I maybe I want to get into a fitness business, but I don't have any idea how to do it. But I love fitness. It's it's basically a platform and a support structure for you to basically get there. If you wanted to start your own company. You got to come up with what is my brand and my logo? How am I going to market my business? What vendors am I going to use? All that kind of stuff. You have to do it from scratch. And what I've learned is that you'll spend the same amount of money over time starting your own business as you will paying a franchise order to basically sell you their system. The difference is that you get all the you get all the information, all the help up front from the franchise system. And you're frankly, in most cases, far less likely to fail. Not it's not a guarantee, but far less likely. Uh, definitely. And what are some of the businesses that are franchises and what are the different fields that are they're in? Is this everything then, or is it anything I mean, or what? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because most people, when they think of franchises, they basically think of restaurants like a Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or Burger King or okay. a gym like an LA Fitness or Planet Fitness or Orange Theory. Um, and maybe they've seen like a, like a Paul Davis restoration or a serve pro restoration business. And, and that's about where, where it ends. It is an incredible number of business segments. I mean, I have business to business services. I've got a, uh, a company that is about cost reduction for large, larger companies that are, you know, with contracts for telecommunications and their internet and, um, the waste removal are, they're completely being overcharged and they'll come in and basically help them figure that kind of stuff out. I have uh, definitely fitness boutique fitness related businesses, but I have fitness businesses that are geared towards just people over the age of 50 Um, all kinds of things in the home services sector. I mean, there are lots of plumbing and HVAC and the electrical franchise systems, not which a lot of people think of that's always a locally owned business. Why does it have to be? It can be, there are franchise systems out there, appliance repair, um, Senior care is another wonderful segment where there's so much opportunity for helping people age at home or even in the medical field. I would say like right now, the the two hottest, three hottest segments are are fitness, any kind of non-opioid pain management and health and wellness type of business is what venture capital firms are looking at. And then the pets, the pet world, man, mobile pet grooming, nuts, Um, pet sitting, pet walking. Uh, pet care, pet training, it, that whole that whole world has got awesome franchise opportunities. So it truly is an astounding array of market segments you can get into. And yeah, I appreciate that explanation. And who who's a franchise for? Like, how do I are we talking about the random random person who wants to be a business owner, or is this the entrepreneur who's already got five businesses and wants another? Uh, what's the approach here? Is this like a super hands-on thing, kind of hands-off? How does it work? Uh, Well, you're going to love this answer. It's all the above. So franchising, I I, I will first start by saying who franchising is not for. If you're somebody who's been working at a corporation and you feel like you're kind of a big ideas person and the people you work for don't really want to entertain your ideas or, or just, you know, they make, hey, you know, thanks for the input but they don't ever implement anything that you come up with, you may be right. You may have some incredible ideas. And I would encourage that kind of person to go out and start their own company. That kind of person is unlikely to do well in a franchise system because 
in a franchise system, it's a system. There is a roadmap and there are guardrails that you have to stay within because the franchisor wants to make sure that your experience at a Chick-fil-A in Orlando is the same as the Chick-fil-A experience in Denver as it is in Chicago, right? And if you deviate from the lines too much, that's a problem for them from a brand continuity perspective. Um, but who it's for? It's that corporate executive or v VP level person who realizes, you know, the only way for me to move up in this organization is to effectively sell my soul to the business and work 70, 80 hours a week, be on the road constantly. And I've got kids at home. And I just don't want to do that. So instead, maybe becoming a business owner with something local, yes, you're still going to work hard, but you're in control of your own destiny. But people at that level typically have the income level and the savings to be able to do this because to get into franchising, like a legitimate franchise, you need at least $50,000 of liquidity that you can put into your business knowing that you may not get that out for a year to two years or more, um, you know, ideally even more. It, it, so again, it's not as much as I would like to say anybody could buy a franchise, you know, a legitimate franchise is not 10,000 bucks. It, it costs money. And the second group is that it, or person would be that corporate executive who is making good money, doesn't want to quit this awesome job, but they want to add an, an additional source of income. There are many franchise systems out there that are They've been more historically called semi-absentee. I like to call them or refer to them as an executive level model where you're hiring a manager and you're managing the manager behind the scenes and then they run your team, whether it's a retail business or a services company going out to people's homes, it doesn't matter. Um, but there can be wonderful opportunities for someone who's got the capital and has that 10 or 15 hours a week of extra bandwidth that they can manage that manager. Third, it's going to be someone who owns a business already and things are going well, they're making money, their team's running things, and they're kind of feeling either they're kind of bored and they want a new challenge, but they don't want to start something from scratch. And maybe they want to add something that can serve the existing customer base. A great example would be someone who owns like a real estate brokerage. They have seven or 10 agents working for them. They're, they're sitting back, they're not doing a lot of selling themselves anymore because their agents are doing a great job. But you know, those are, those are seven to 10 year transactions before you have that customer reaching out to you again, typically. Why not own a recurring revenue business like a home cleaning business or a lawn landscaping company or own the, own the moving company that's going to move your clients from point A to point B? Or they buy that house and they want to do some renovation work. Why not own the renovation company? I mean, it, there, there's some awesome opportunities there for existing business owners. Um, those are the, the typical profiles, I guess I would say, that I'm, I'm working with. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And it's interesting because not everyone everyone has their own mold and it's really to whatever cup of tea you want it to be and correct the interesting, yeah, yeah the because interesting you, you, thing you, you, is, I, sorry I'll, I'll just say that because there are full-time opportunities there are that kind of more semi-absentee executive level management opportunities and then there's some franchises that will run the business for you you pay them an extra few percentage points off the top and you literally are just investing money and they'll do it for you not as many of those but yeah, it's 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 all the above. And the additional stream of revenue, because the interesting thing is that you mentioned that some of them take a little bit longer to start up, and then some of them are a little bit uh, kind of on demand, like they're doing their thing, like a lawn care. H how does that work? That's like you pick up a line, and then you're managing, making sure that they're all doing it. How does that work? Well. So with, with that, with every franchise system and with any business in general, you got to go out and find clients. And with some franchises, they'll show you what the sales process is, and they'll give you the tools to use. And you got to get out there, and you got to beat the bushes, pound the pavement, whatever, whatever analogy or, or term you want to use, and find those clients. There are some franchise systems that actually have a nationwide calling center. They manage all your social media and digital marketing, and they're even setting appointments for you. I actually like those kind of businesses because, frankly. Unless I'm working with a client that has been a professional salesperson, it's oftentimes one of the weaker skills that a, a, a new entrepreneur will bring to the table. Um, so, so that part, part of that can be brought to the table by the franchisor, but you know their responsibility is to provide you with a solid roadmap on how to find those clients and build those relationships. And so, to get started, and and you know how you I guess. You choose that is really going to be a function of, are you quitting your job or are you keeping your job? Are you willing to sell or are you not so willing to sell? Um, 
And even if you are willing to sell, if you don't want to, okay, no problem. You know, and then I have to use all that criteria, all those criteria and filter that through the hundreds of brands that I represent to figure out which ones then make the most sense. And, and effectively, I pitch my clients on these different brands and I remind them, you know, these are the things you told me you wanted, or these are the criteria that you gave me, or this is the kind of lifestyle you want as a business owner. And that's how or why this particular opportunity represents that kind of pathway. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And for you, you mentioned that you recently sold a business. What was that experience like? Because was that a franchise as well? Yeah, it was a franchise trampoline park. I was part of the Sky Zone group. And um, I, I will say it was hard, uh, way, way harder than I would have expected. Um, you know, I was impressed with the level of due diligence that that the buyers went through. I mean, granted, I was selling to the corporate parents. So we're talking about, you know, an $800 million company. So, I mean, you know, they, they have executives who know what the hell they're doing. And, you know, they they effectively hired the equivalent of like a forensic accounting firm to look through my books. I mean, I was being asked questions about expenses from two and three years ago. And I'm like, I, I tried to forget 2020, the pandemic, you know. Um, and but you're, it was, you're, one of their, you're one of their franchisees at this point prior to the correct. sale. Correct. Yeah, they happen to have a strategy where about a third of their total corporate or a third of their total worldwide locations are owned by the corporate organization. That's not that's not typical. Um, you know, with any kind of buyer, if you've got a sophisticated buyer, I mean, they're going to come in and they're going to they're going to turn your business inside and out if they're smart. And they got to make sure you're not hiding income or you're hiding expenses. Uh, you know, what's really common in business is a lot of business owners will put a lot of personal expenses to their company. I mean, you can kind of get away with it within reason. Um, but you have to pull that stuff out because that that deflates the value of your business over time. And so I, I've always tried to keep things pretty clean also because I've had investors. And so it's not fair to them if I'm paying for my wife's car, you know, or paying for vacation that I, I'm technically calling a business retreat, which again, a lot of people do. Uh, you know, thankfully, I never did that with this business. And so the due diligence work I went through, I didn't have to explain any of that kind of stuff away. But it was... Um, it was really an eye-opening experience, and you know, I I had to hire a legal a legal support. I had a lawyer I was working with, who thankfully knew a lot more about this than I did. I had hired six months prior a fractional CFO to help me really clean up my books and pro help provide me with some projections for the future in the event that I didn't sell. And um, it, it God didn't make all the difference in the world to be having professional help. You know, I, I brought it up before. You can't do this alone. Um, you got to tap into the right professionals in this kind of circumstance. You can't, and you also have to realize just because you built something doesn't mean it's worth what you think it is. It, it, most entrepreneurs yeah. have an absolutely inflated value on, on their business. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky. I had a great team. So I actually built a solidly profitable business and I got paid a, a multiple that was appropriate. And, um, I was happy with that number, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that go into these types of circumstances and transactions with completely unrealistic expectations, and they kill the deal because they're not willing to be realistic. Yeah, and I think that comes from two points. I think that comes from one, where they can't get a real number in their head is because they're much too close to the business because they are the business. So it's, it's a lot of effort that they're putting in the sweat equity, and they're like, I definitely deserve more, too. When you bring out that outside help, what caught, did you know that you were going to sell? And you're like, I think this is the time. Because the always the interesting strategy is when do you bring in the help? When do you do it on your own? And when do you, you know what I mean? Because obviously in the beginning of a business, you're like, I thought this was going to be easy. I thought I was just, I signed up for the franchise. I get my books. I'm ready to go. <laughs> like, well, I, 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 again, I've been... I've been fortunate that over the years I've I've been part of some different kind of mastermind groups and other and entrepreneurs way more successful than me. And any good advisor or coach is going to tell you that you need to be planning for your exit five years in advance. Okay, I wasn't that far in advance with my own planning, but um, you know, hiring someone like a fractional CFO if you don't have one for your business or it's too small to have a CFO. Um, occasionally talking to a tax strategist, and which I I do all the time. You know, I had to because. Yeah, in the in the first years of that business, it was a very asset heavy business. So I had lots of great depreciation, but that's starting to wane towards these now sixth and seventh year. And I had to get real about what else could I be doing with my business structure. Um, 
and then the legal support. You know, as much as I don't like how much lawyers make in the in the world of business, uh, I will say in this particular case, you know, I don't even know what my bill is going to be yet. Um, but it doesn't matter. I couldn't have done it without him. I wouldn't have gotten there without him. And so, you really need to have your goals in mind at a minimum three years in advance. In my in my personal perspective, you set that goal. I don't care how you know you've ever heard of the term BHAG, the big hairy audacious goal or something like that. It doesn't matter how big the goal is. If you don't set it, you're never going to get there. And if that includes selling my business for four times what I you know what I think it's worth today, great then set the pieces in place and bring the people on, even if they're fractional people to help you get there. And um, that's, you know, in, in a shorter time horizon is what I ultimately did. And sure, it cost me money. At the end of the day, I mean, yeah. a little bit less than the sale. Yeah, but again, the sale wouldn't have happened if I didn't have professional representation in this transaction, period. They would not have dealt with me personally. In fact, I learned a- along the way that, they had a couple of other owners they were talking to, but the owners were so unrealistic about what their businesses are worth and weren't working with a lawyer that they said, see ya. I'm not going to work. You know, yeah. Forget it. They pulled back their offer. What a stupid way to lose the opportunity to sell your company because you're not willing to either get the support that you need or because you think it's worth what you think it's worth and you don't have any kind of outside perspective. Yeah, and I think the major thing is that you were willing to think about your life going forward. Like you were sitting there going, I have three years ahead of time because I've talked about this a lot on this podcast and with other people that we have all these people who want to set a new year's goal and we set it for one year. Cool. That's fine. But if we look at the parameters of five years or 10 years or 20 years or infinity, and you start looking at those longer parameters, you'll see life in a different direction. And your decisions are going to be very, very different, drastically different than if you're thinking in minutes, hours, days. Because if you need like money in this moment right now, you're a different person than, hey, I'm good. I don't need this right now. And that's why you can't have that financial stress and you want to remove that as early as possible. Yeah. And one of the things too, that um, I definitely have seen is that, you know, look, you can set goals that are completely unrealistic. So you have, there has to be some reality built into what you think you can do with your business. But I, I have a local business coach that I know here in the Madison, Wisconsin market. His name is Kyle Arneson. He's, he's older than I am. He's been around the block many times uh, more than I have. And he's, um, he said to me recently, with some of his clients when, when they've done like $2 million this year. And he says, so what's your goal next year? Well, I want to get to 3 million. He's like, why, why don't you want to go for more? Set go for 5 million. And next year you're going to hit 10 million and I'm going to show you how to do it. And he, he, he over and over again, he says, it's not about it. it and yes, it's about having the right people in place and having good marketing and having strong structures, but more than anything, it's having the mindset. If your mind is focused on something that's much further in the distance, you're far more likely to continue to push in that direction and not accept just mediocre you know, improvements. You're going to focus on getting there. And as long as you don't do it in a way that's like a slave driver to your team, right? you can get there. And he said, with most of my clients, they always overachieve when I change their mindset on their business. It's kind of the same way. I, I, learned this, I learned this when I was learning how to drive as a, as a 16-year-old. My dad taught me, you know, like when you're turning, I don't know if you do this, but when you're turning like a long corner on a road, don't look right in front of you. Look at the farthest point in the turn and the car and the way you steer will automatically keep turning the right way with the curve in the road. And the same analogy applies, I think, in business is that you need to be looking at what's happening today. You know, you don't want to run into something that's right in front of your car, but at the same point in time, you always need to be also looking in the distance. You have to be able to do both. Yeah, and I think I think it works even for your life and your body and well, your sure. friendships Absolutely. and a, a lot a lot of different parameters. Because the thing is, if you set that goal for let's go with that example you said, where it's two million, they're making two million, bump it up to five million, you're asking different questions. <laughs> bump it up to ten million, you're asking much different questions. It's like, how do we take over the system? How do we take over this? How do we help this? How do we do this? And you're looking at the world in a slightly different way. And when you can control yeah. the constraints where you go, hey, we have five minutes to provide the most value possible. 
How are we going to do that? Your brain's thinking about it differently. So for the audience listening, these are good questions to ask yourself, not 10 million, 5 million, any of that, but just asking yourself the tougher questions like, what would it take to double my income? What would it take for me to lose 25 pounds? What would it take for this to occur? Your brain can come up with those solutions and that would be super, super valuable. Um, Aaron, I know our time is winding down. Do you want to, do you have something to say? Yeah, well, you you, you hit on something of, of just a short moment ago that kind of related to like losing weight, taking care of yourself. Um, we talked about this before the podcast recording. You know, one of the things that I learned the hard way is that being an entrepreneur can be very stressful. Um, my first two businesses I own with my now ex-wife and you know, we, we, we had a great run, but we decided to get divorced and we still worked together for about a year and a half. And that was leading up into the 2007, 2008 kind of economic maelstrom. That was the kind of real estate collapse, right? And we went from a seven figure net worth, we owned three properties to we lost everything. I had a negative net worth. Um, as a result of what happened. And I got so stressed out that I actually had a heart attack. And I was 36. I wasn't overweight, didn't have heart disease of any sort. Um, it was purely the result of stress. And I, it turns out I ended up uh, knowing of people who during that same time period died of something quite similar. They were just less fortunate than I was. But it, what it taught me, aside from, God, relax and, and maybe meditate or, or something, but it's, it's that you, you can't do it all. And you also can't control everything. There's, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an overly religious person or spiritual person, but there's the serenity prayer that is, you know, akin to the whole words of, you know, help me, under, help me realize the differences between the things that I cannot control and the things that I can and, and, you know, be able to differentiate the two and focus on the stuff that I can't control. It, that has been since then kind of a, a permutation of everything that I do is just letting go of the things that I can't control and focusing on the ones that I can. And, you know, and if I screw something up, okay, I screwed something up. If I hurt somebody's feelings, apologize, move on, you know, but um, you definitely have to remember as an entrepreneur, uh, failure is an option, but it doesn't mean it's the end of your life. You know, it's, it's, your health is always more important. The relationships with your family are always more important than the business. And that's sometimes very difficult for even today. Um, 16, 18 years later to sometimes remember, but it's such a critical part is taking care of yourself because you know, no one's going to keep building that business for you if you're gone. Absolutely. I really appreciate you sharing that and having the vulnerability and giving that sentiment of the importance of health and being close with those relationships that you think are important. So Aaron, where can people learn about franchises? Where can they learn more about you? Where can they get in touch? The best way is just go to it's aaronbakken.com. That's A A R O N B A K K E N.com. And I've got two different pathways in there. One is for the people that want to find a franchise to invest in, and the other is for the people who have a business and they think that they want to get into franchising and become a franchise opportunity for others. And then my group, our the franchise consulting company, we have an entire ecosystem of support organizations that we've created that help people navigate the whole world of franchising. I can help with financing, legal support. Or just help people identify if they should even be in business for themselves at all. Um, everything that I do is free. I get paid by the franchisors I represent. So, frankly, if anybody's ever even thought about getting into business, they should take some time to talk to me or someone like me who's in the world of franchise consulting. It's not going to cost them anything but a bit of their time. And uh, the most important piece is, as I think have been a recurring theme of this conversation, you can't get there alone. So why not start from the very beginning with someone you – just kind of been there, done that, and has um, the ability to create a nice roadmap for you. Absolutely. And Aaron is super passionate about franchising. He can help. And I'll put his link in the show notes. And I recommend if you guys have some time, if you want to just learn about it, reach out to Aaron and really see what maybe there's something there. Who knows? Thank you, guys. And I really appreciate the time. Thank you for reaching the end of the podcast. For that, we'll give you a complimentary coaching session in the link below with Edwards Consulting. Hope to see you there and have a great day and keep clocking in.